here with us uh, over the lunch hour. Um, but also, please know that this is a safe space. And if there are any questions you have, we are more than welcome to, we're more than happy to answer them as best we can. Um, a lot of people submitted questions before the webinar, and we really appreciate that. So we're going to try to get to that list first. And then please feel free to chime in if there are things that we may not have missed or things that aren't clear. Um, Abby, is there anything else you want to add before we jump in? No, I think that's it. Just put your questions in the Q&A and we'll try our best to kind of get to everything. And some of your topics may be covered down the line as well. So um, hold tight if you are interested in something and you just haven't heard about it yet. Okay, that sounds great. So maybe just to frame the conversation, I'm going to just share my screen and we're going to talk about um, a couple issues that are going on here in Washington State and locally. And I think, let's see. Abby, can you see my full screen now? Okay, super. So what, what I want you to take away, this is from our um, Washington State Department of Health dashboard. And you can see that we are really very clearly uh, in the middle of our fifth surge based on cases here in Washington and around the country. Um, and you can see that this surge, we are still having over 3,000 cases a day just in Washington alone, um, which really um, boggles my mind when you think about you know, what, what we've been through over the last uh, 18 months. And then the question comes up, you know, how severe are these cases? Are they severe enough to be hospitalized? And so these are hospitalization counts. These are people who have COVID-19 who are in the hospital with COVID. And you can see all the way on the right that this is a huge surge impacting hospital resources all around our state and surrounding states. Um, and so even though uh, there are, you know, we have relatively high vaccination rates in King County, uh, the majority of these folks are unvaccinated and are quite sick in the hospital. And in fact, you know, for the first time during this pandemic, we are seeing states move to what we call crisis standards of care. And that means, you know, because hospital resources are so overwhelmed by people with COVID, they are unable to provide normal medical care. And so we're hearing about care being delivered outside of normal traditional hospital spaces, people having needed procedures that are canceled, and hospitals not having enough doctors or nurses to care for patients. This is impacting all of our hospitals. Um, and, you know, and as much as we wanna help out our neighboring states, we are just unable to accept every transfer request. And so there are patients who are in limbo or just not getting the care that we would expect to occur in the United States of America. And I think as healthcare workers, you know, both Abby and I, we just can't tell you how devastating this is and how, you know, sadly, uh, it's, it's, you know, preventable through vaccination. And this is the last slide I'm going to show. Um, this is really, really powerful data from our very own King County. And you can see a separation in people who are not fully vaccinated compared to people who are fully vaccinated. And the link to the dashboard is down below. But really, the, the take home point here is that people who test positive are seven times more likely to be unvaccinated. People who are unvaccinated are 41 times more likely to be hospitalized than their matched peers who are fully vaccinated. So that means regardless of your age, we're matching 18 year olds to 18 year olds and 75 to 75 year olds. You're 41 times more likely to be hospitalized if you're unvaccinated and you have COVID. And the same thing is true of death. So death is what we call a lagging indicator. We're seeing hospitalization surge now, and then I, we expect that there's gonna be a surge of deaths. And so this number will only continue to go up, but this is something that unfortunately, Dr. Hussein and I see almost every day play out in the hospital. We're seeing a lot of people dying of COVID. Unfortunately, there's a big, big gap in people who are unvaccinated compared to those who are vaccinated. So those are just some very sobering uh, numbers that I wanted to share with you. Um, and I think probably a lot of you are familiar with those, but um, Abby, is there anything else you wanna add or should we jump into the questions? 
I think this is a great kind of indicator of how we know what COVID can do to people, at least the disease process. And so I think a lot of people's questions are about what can the vaccine do to you? And so I think it's super helpful to kind of get that idea and get those numbers, at least even within our area, just to really kind of frame that thought process. And, you know, this is the reason that we hold these kind of open forums so that we can have these discussions so that we can really get people um, their questions answered and get them feeling comfortable with getting vaccinated just so we can see a change in these numbers. Uh, so I think we can go into kind of some people's main concerns, which, as I'm sure you guys know, are really around side effects and the safety of the vaccine, um, along with a couple other topics that we're going to cover here. Um, so Dr. Cohen, actually, I would like to ask you, you know, we've heard about some of the side effects, one of which some people have had um, severe kind of skin reactions that have been treated and worked with. And I think some people want to know what about other skin side effects of the vaccine, whether those are more on the mild side. Have we heard anything about that? Yeah, it's a, it's a really great question. And I'll just say, you know, we're, we're drawing on our experience here at UW Medicine, where we vaccinated over 400,000 people thus far, that includes staff and patients. And then, of course, you know, the hundreds of millions of vaccines that have been given out you know, across our country. And what we've seen so far is that, you know, skin reactions tend to be extremely mild. Uh, they come in a couple different flavors. One is just some localized redness at the vaccine site. It takes a few days to resolve. Sometimes it can be a little tender. Sometimes you just notice a redness that goes away. Um, it's generally not a big deal. And you can still get a subsequent um, dose if you're starting one of the mRNA series. The other type of skin reaction that we've seen are these what we call delayed reactions. And this is something that was actually new uh, for me. I hadn't seen that before, um, but it happens you know, probably about a week or so after the vaccine, and you just get a little reaction, which is probably where it, it sort of, you know that the vaccine is working, you get a little reaction uh, right around the vaccine site. Um, sometimes it can be a little bit larger, feel like a circle that's around your shoulder. It gets better after a few days, there's nothing special that you need to do about it, and you can still get the next vaccine. So just to summarize, yes, there are uh, some skin reactions, they tend to be extremely uh, mild or moderate, I would say. And in general, they don't prevent people from getting subsequent doses. So Abby, um, I have a couple questions for you. Um, so the first one I see is, and I think this is a really important question having to do um, particularly with, uh, you know, sort of reproduction and hormones, so those sorts of themes. And one person wrote in, uh, I heard recently that the J&J &J vaccine can affect estrogen levels. Someone I know who was um, taking her oral contraceptives 100% of the time and became pregnant shortly after receiving the vaccine. What do we know about the J&J &J vaccine and hormones? And should women taking hormonal contraceptives be advised about pregnancy risk? So do you have any thoughts about any of that? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I would also like to, you know, direct people to, I think last week we had a straight talk as well at Friday, and that was basically all around kind of fertility and all these things. So if you need more information, that talk is a helpful resource. Um, but I would say that uh, regardless of what vaccine we're talking about, there really has been no evidence that any of these vaccines, at least approved for use in the U.S., affect hormone levels in a way that would affect anyone's ability to get pregnant or anybody's inability to get pregnant. So Things, people and groups such as the CDC and the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, all of them have strongly advised um, that people who are pregnant or planning to get pregnant receive the vaccine um, because there really has been no adverse effects, whether related to hormones or kind of effects going forward on the fetus or development um, or someone's ability to actually get pregnant. So I would say that overall, what we've seen is that really there's not there was a huge database of people when, you know, people were getting vaccinated early on and these kind of outcomes have been followed for some time now. And there really has been no difference between those who got vaccinated and those who did not. And again, that's for Moderna, Pfizer and the J&J &J vaccine. I, I completely agree. And I, you know, we talk about this with our OB colleagues or obstetrics and gynecology colleagues all the time. And they are such huge proponents of giving the vaccine. And to me, it feels like or I'd say, you know, not to speak for them, but I think they would consider it, you know, below the standard of care not to offer somebody who's pregnant or thinking about becoming pregnant the vaccine. And that's because we have just seen time and time again, so many pregnant people admitted to the hospital and have really unfortunate outcomes or deliver, you know, before 30 weeks and the, the child at risk. So, so many reasons to get the vaccine if you're pregnant or thinking about becoming pregnant. 
Yeah, I think it's, you know, it seems unclear to a lot of people what the future holds with vaccines. But I think what we see currently is that when you're not vaccinated and you do have COVID, those effects are devastating. Um, and I, so I think that's really what we're weighing out here. I think that brings us to other questions as far as, you know, we say that these vaccines are safe and we're confident in them. Um, and I think some people are wondering, is there an equivalent amount of evidence for how confident we are in these vaccines as we are with other vaccines, such as like the flu that most people get annually um, and yeah. how we would kind of go about that? Yeah, it's, it's such a good question. I, I realize that people still have some lingering safety concerns. You know, I, I read something amazing this week um, that was, you know, 5.8 billion people around the world have been given uh, a dose of a COVID vaccine, which is just incredible. And, you know, with that number of vaccines, you expect to see some amount of side effects just statistically. And I would say we have not seen any major safety signals despite over 5 billion shots given, which is just incredible. And then I think that the, the other question is, you know, what about long-term side effects? And I would say, you know, long-term side effects don't really occur with vaccines. And that's really because particularly, you know, this vaccine is broken down by your body after injection. And it's sort of like a Snapchat message. It teaches your body to recognize that spike protein. And then it just degrades it and breaks it down. Um, but I would say on the flip side, you know, long-term effects of COVID are super common, no matter what your age is. And, you know, I, I'm sure Dr. Hussein, you're in the same camp, but you know, I still have patients who have difficulty breathing or difficulty with fatigue, ringing in their ears, brain fog, you know, six, eight months, a year after their initial infection. So clearly long, long-term consequences of getting COVID, um, but really no long-term consequences of you know, getting the vaccine. Yeah, I would agree. I know people who still have not regained their full sense of smell or taste. Um, and that has been ongoing and they were sick about a year ago. And I think the other thing to know about the evidence as well is that while we, a lot of us didn't get this vaccine until early 2021, these trials started back last year in the late summer. And so we have those participants that we followed for that time over a year now. So I think that's also really helpful data to kind of garner more information for the longer aspects of the vaccine, like you mentioned. That, that's such a good, such a good point. And I know, you know, mRNA vaccines feel a little, a little new to us. Um, but of course, this stands on the shoulders of research that's been done over you know decade or more. Um, so we still have a lot of data from people who have previously received mRNA vaccines even before COVID-19. So I, I think all, all of us feel very, very comfortable with the safety profile of these vaccines. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, some of the common things too that people are concerned about, like we mentioned with mRNA, anytime we mention anything with NA, we think of DNA. And I think there's been a lot of concerns um, about how that mRNA interacts with our body. And I think it's important for people to know that the mRNA, kind of like you were saying, Dr. Cohen, is you really just like a little snap and then kind of disappears, but it does not interact or integrate with our, integrate with our DNA in any way that's capable of altering anything whether that should lead to changes people are concerned about, you know, cancer, long-term side effects, genetic codes, you know, it is really incapable of doing any of that because it does not enter our DNA in that way. And I think that was one of the main things that popped up in the beginning, which is understandable. Anytime you hear NA, we're really just used to the D coming out before that. So we worry, um, you know, is this going to mess with my body in a way that it's not predictable? But again, I think the studies that we've done, and we know a lot about mRNA even prior to COVID, is that it cannot interact with ourselves. So I wanna let, lay that kind of concern and worry to rest. Yeah, those, those are really good points. You know, sometimes when I talk to my kids about this, my kids have started calling it like a little peanut M&M where, you know, it melts in your mouth, but not in your hand. These vaccines are very unstable. So as soon as they, you know, they, they are basically stable enough with this candy coating to go into your arm, and then they just start to break down immediately. They show your immune system a little picture of what it's supposed to recognize and then it just melts away and all you're left with is immunity. All right, well, thanks for covering those questions about you know, genetic code and, and risks of cancer, Abby. I wonder if we should, um, do you wanna switch gears a little bit and talk a little about sort of some testing questions and some immunity questions? Yeah, for sure. Okay, so the first one that I see is, what is the difference between the vaccine antibody and acquired immunity from COVID infection? Mm. So. I think it's a question, you know, is one stronger than the other? Um, if somebody already had COVID, do they still need a vaccine? And why would I get the vaccination if I can just get COVID? 
Yeah, uh, this, these are a lot of great questions. So one, I would say the difference between the acquired immunity from the disease and the vaccine is that we know the immunity from the disease is more short lived. So we know that it lasts for about maybe three months in our system, whereas the vaccine immunity is much longer than that. How long exactly is still being seen and being studied? I know everyone's heard talks about boosters and third vaccines. So that is, you know, yet to be clear going forward, um, but definitely twice as long, if not longer than just getting COVID. And you can get reinfected with COVID again, whether you've had it or not. And so anyone who's had it, we are strongly encouraging you to get vaccinated because again, that immunity is gonna disappear after 90 days and you're no longer protected. So getting that vaccine will extend that immunity going off for as long as we know. Um, I think the other thing to know is that yes, if you're vaccinated, there have been some small cases of breakthrough, meaning you could still get sick, especially when we have variants running around. The benefit of the vaccination, though, is that it not only decreases your chances of catching COVID, it, if you still happen to get it, it significantly decreases the severity of the disease, the chance of hospitalization, the likelihood of death, all those things that Dr. Cohen mentioned earlier kind of in that graph. And that's really where we see that shift. And that's why it's so important. Because even if you can catch it, it's the difference between catching a little common cold versus ending up in the hospital on a tube or needing help and support breathing. So I think that's really the message there is whether you've had COVID or not, get vaccinated. And even if you get sick after the vaccination, at least we know that you're likely not going to progress into a severe illness. And that's the hope going forward. So what I'm hearing you say is vaccine-induced immunity is stronger, better, and probably longer lasting than natural yep. immunity. Mm -hmm. I read a really interesting study, um, I think it was last week in The Lancet, which actually showed that in addition to all the things that you mentioned for vaccines being better than um, you know, natural immunity, um, people who are fully immune also have lower chances of getting long COVID, uh, which you know I think we always suspected, yeah. but we didn't actually see that data. And so to me, and I think to a lot of my patients, that's really compelling that they can reduce their chances of having long-term symptoms from COVID. Mm -hmm. That's a big risk if you're just waiting for natural immunity. Yeah, I agree, I agree. I think the other thing that comes up when we're talking about different types of immunity is also, you know, do we test our immunity? Are there tests to see whether we're protected, whether we're infected? And I think there has been so much production and change in that so that it leads for a little bit of confusion for people. So maybe um, Dr. Cohen, if you can explain the different types of tests to detect COVID infection and which ones we consider most accurate or that we've seen kind of be better or more, you know, um, more clear of infection. Yeah, definitely. You know, testing is a subject that's kind of near and dear to my heart. Um, so I, I'm happy to talk a little bit about it. And if people still have questions, please feel free to type them into the, the Q&A. So, you know, there are sort of two or three major types of tests. Um, there are tests to see if somebody has a new infection. And those are either sort of, you know, the rapid antigen tests that you might see at your local drugstore or PCR tests, which usually, you know, end up uh, going to a, a clinic or some other facility to do. And both of those are the ones where you swab your nose and then you get a result. And the PCR tests are very, very sensitive. They're so sensitive that they can actually stay positive for you know, weeks to months. And the challenge is that people are only contagious for a short amount of time. So if you have a positive PCR test, we actually don't recommend repeating it for you know, three months unless somebody has new symptoms or a new exposure. So those are the nasal swabs, and we use them all the time. If somebody has new symptoms and a positive nasal swab, you know, we say, yeah, yes, you have a new diagnosis of COVID. The other types of tests that you might be hearing about are the antibody tests, and you know, Dr. Hussein just, just mentioned them. So the antibody tests are blood tests, and those are good for checking to see if somebody may have had infection previously. It can also show you know, whether you're potentially vaccinated or not. And I think these can be helpful on a community level or a population level to show, you know, to give you a sense of how many people may have been infected. They're not that helpful for the patient who's sitting in front of me. Um, you know, antibody tests can take three to four weeks to become positive. And so there's not a lot of useful information that we have on an individual level. There's probably some scenarios where we might use it. But on a whole, if you think you have COVID, we really want you to go out and get tested with a nasal swab. And I think like we've discussed, you know, having the antibody doesn't always mean 100% that you aren't going to get infected. And so if you feel like you have symptoms, regardless of if you're vaccinated recently or a while ago, getting tested is really the best kind of option from that way. 
Yep, absolutely. And I think the other wrinkle with testing is, you know, rapid tests are very common in the community, but I think it's hard to know when to actually use them. And they're not quite as sensitive as the PCRs. So if a rapid test is positive, that can be really helpful. But if it's negative and somebody really has symptoms or you have a high suspicion, they still probably need to get a PCR test to really confirm whether it's truly negative or not. Yeah, that's super helpful to know. Okay, so Abby, a couple other questions on this theme. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see, one is, I'm vaccinated. Should I be afraid to mingle with non-vaccinated people? That's a really important practical question. It is. And I would say, you know, I don't want anyone to be afraid of anything, really. It's not a scare tactic with COVID. But I think what we really want is people to be mindful and safe. So uh, if you are going to see loved ones or people who are close to you who are unvaccinated, I think our recommendation will always be make sure that you are masked because you can, like we've stated, still get COVID even if you're vaccinated. And we still have people who are asymptomatic carriers. So just because the person you're with may not be feeling any you know, large symptoms or have these like runny nose, cough, doesn't mean that someone can't be a carrier. And so really the safest thing to do is to stay masked, whether you're, especially if you're indoors, also if you're in outdoors in a crowded setting. I know the weather is changing now here in Washington. So the likelihood of a lot of outdoor things is limited, but if people are still getting out there, if you're with large groups, if you're at events, sporting events or anything like that, remaining mass, whether you're around vaccinated or unvaccinated people, honestly, is gonna be your safest route. Um, so don't not see people, just see them as safely as you can. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And this is something that's really changed with Delta. You know, before Delta, we really did not see a lot of outdoor transmission, but this summer, you know, there have been a number of music festivals and other big get togethers where we have seen outdoor transmission occur. Um, and so I think that's the reason why King County is enacting this mandate for large group gatherings where people need to be masked. And al always we prefer, you know, people be outdoors rather than indoors. I think the risk is still very low, um, but you know, all of us need to be vigilant and vaccination is the most important piece of the puzzle, but all the other layers are still really important. And I think also now that we're running into kind of the cold flu season, another important reminder is that masks, other than just protecting against COVID, have shown us in the last year that they protect against all these other viral illnesses as well. So we don't see as much flu, we don't see as much of these other things passing around. So it's a win-win, right? If you're not just worried about COVID and you still don't want to be sick or down for a time period, these masks are helping prevent those other viral infections as well. That's a, that's a really great point. I think when we start talking about, you know, people can still spread when they're asymptomatic. That brings up a lot of questions for people as well. Um, and some concern that, you know, I think this is specific to the hospital setting, but also maybe people's work settings as well. If people are increasing their in-office frequency, are there gonna be things that are gonna be done to catch these asymptomatic cases, um, to see if anyone has breakthroughs, even if they're vaccinated, just to kind of protect going forward? Do you have any insights on that, do you think, Dr. Cohen? Yeah, well, it's, a, it's also a very, very good question and something we think a lot about in employee health and infection prevention. And, you know, one, yes, we do see breakthrough cases and, you know, the vaccines are incredible at preventing severe illness and death and hospitalization. They're pretty good at preventing infection, but they're not perfect and they're not, that's not exactly what they're designed to do. So I think those are, you know, that's probably why the person is asking that question. Um, but they also are really good at preventing transmission. And so if you're vaccinated, even if you're positive, you're still helping to protect your colleagues just by virtue of being positive. And I would say I'm always in favor of more testing. Um, we, you know, we are seeing some breakthrough infections, which means we still need to stick to our other layers of protection in the workplace. So being masked and distanced. But just to give you a sense of the numbers, you know, every day our employee health teams investigate, you know, probably somewhere between one to three cases of staff a day, some of these are vaccinated, some are not. Um, but you know, you compare that to the total amount of people in UW Medicine, which is like 20,000. And so it's, it's I, I fully believe that people should be able to access testing when they want it, especially if there's an exposure or new symptoms, but it's just from an organizational standpoint, it is really hard to operationalize routine testing for thousands upon thousands of staff. And so I'd much rather you know, focus on vaccinations and getting people vaccinated because we know that's what keeps staff and patients safe. And I, I would just say the one last thing I'd add is 
testing is important, but you know, it's still a snapshot in time. And even if you're negative one day, it doesn't mean you couldn't turn positive the next. So, you know, there, there are pros and cons with testing people weekly. I think we've seen that in a lot of the big sporting events and kind of the teams, a lot of them have instituted, you know, just for practice and playing sake, weekly or daily testing, and there still have been clusters of outbreaks in those groups. So I think that really goes to show that while testing is extremely helpful and we want people to get tested, really vaccination and kind of prevention and mask wearing is still going to be key in this. Yeah, I completely agree. So hopefully, you know, I know that um, many of the test sites, it feels like the lines are long. We're working very hard to increase capacity for testing in general, both for our you know, UW Medicine patients and staff, but also people in the community. And there's a lot of work being done to partner with King County and the city of Seattle to increase capacity at the test sites. Um, Abby, I wonder if we should switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about um, prevention of COVID, but also treatment of COVID. Yeah. And there are a couple of questions about, you know, specific therapies. So the, one of the ones that I see is what do the recent studies show about vitamin D in prevention and treatment of COVID-19? Yeah, so I think a lot of these treatment prevention questions are tricky because in the beginning we were, no one knew what was going on with COVID. So every little thing we thought that we could test or we could see or that we could correlate with, we tried. And so some of those studies that we have done aren't as scientifically rigorous in regards to you know some of the drugs, but I think people over time have continued to study these things. Vitamin D was one of the things that had been looked at uh, in the past. And you know, despite some of the studies that were done, none of them really showed super strong evidence that it was gonna be beneficial. Um, I think we know that excess levels of anything in our body, including vitamins, can be dangerous or lead to toxicities. And so from a perspective of just healthcare in general, I would say, unless you have documented low levels of vitamin D, um, then definitely talk to your primary care doctor um, before you think about taking any extra supplementation, just because we really haven't seen uh, much data to show that it's that helpful. Um, it may be beneficial to have your regular level of vitamin D, like a healthy normal. So if you're deficient, maybe getting up to that normal level would be helpful. But as far as excess use of that, I'm not really sure I've seen much. Dr. Cohen, I don't know if you've seen anything new either. No, I haven't. Um, I think some of the other things and that people have heard a lot about too and treatments that we're kind of seeing around is um, these idea of these monoclonal antibody treatments. Um, and I'm sure some people in the audience might be familiar with them, but Dr. Cohen, do you think you can give us a little bit more of insight of how that's going if we've seen that working and what we as UW or those around us are doing to provide that as an option for people? Yeah, so, so this is really a new um, challenge for us and uh, in, in how to deliver monoclonal antibodies to people quickly who need them. And monoclonal antibodies can be effective in a very selected population. So people who are at you know, very high risk of developing complications from COVID, but only if they're given early. So the challenge for our health system is finding somebody who's positive and figuring out if they have you know, additional risk factors and then very quickly connecting them to care. And getting these monoclonal antibodies means either getting an infusion, so it means you need some trained people to start an IV and monitor it, and then there's a whole waiting period afterwards. Or you get these subcutaneous injections, which is like four injections all over your body, and actually patients have tolerated that really, really well. The challenge is it's incredibly resource intensive. Um, there are limited spots available and it's not clear, this is all of the allocation of these monoclonal antibodies is now being coordinated at, at the state level. And so it's not clear we actually have enough monoclonals to go around you know, for everybody who needs them. So I would say, you, you know, even though really prominent people in our country have received monoclonal antibodies, we can't just count on receiving them, you know, and not and skipping vaccination. You know, to me, that feels a little bit like, you know, not wearing your seatbelt and you know counting on your airbag to protect you um, when you don't even know if your car has an airbag. Um, so I, I would just be very hesitant about that approach, um, but I am thankful that for some people who are able to receive them, it probably does make a difference. I think that's a great analogy with the seatbelt and airbag. And I think you know the other thing too is even if you are able to get these monoclonal antibodies and you stay unvaccinated, as we've discussed with variants and new things coming up, you can always get COVID again. 
right, going forward. And again, the best option is still going to be to be vaccinated to prevent those long-term side effects and risks. Um, I think one of the other things that's been very prominent and popular in the media recently is uh, this talk of ivermectin. Um, and I know the data has kind of been all over the place and every place practices differently. So obviously we can't speak for all the other locations. Um, but do you think you could tell us a little bit more about our, the role of ivermectin and what we found here and kind of what we decide to do with that going forward? Because I think that's been a very hot topic. Oh, it's, uh, yes, absolutely. I think anybody who's on social media or just watches the news is, you know, bound to see something on ivermectin, which is funny because it's, you know, it's a drug that we in infectious diseases have used for a long time, but it's usually for people who have parasites. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's something about this pandemic that I think has people searching for miracle cures. And I, I you know, I, I completely understand that impulse. I mean, we want, we need a pill that is gonna make a difference um, in this fight against COVID. And I think first, you know, we were looking at hydroxychloroquine or azithromycin and other you know, vitamins and supplements as Dr. Hussein mentioned, you know, and now we're talking about ivermectin. And I would love to see an effective medication, but unfortunately what we're really seeing is increased calls to poison control centers for people taking ivermectin off label. Um, you know, unfortunately the studies for ivermectin are, you know, for lack of a better word, really terrible. Um, and I know of actually zero infectious disease doctors, zero critical care doctors who would ever recommend ivermectin for their patients. And even Merck, which is the company that makes ivermectin and stands to make a profit from people buying it, has come out and strongly said that their product should not be used to treat COVID. So without getting into the nitty gritty about why the studies are bad or why we have concerns about the methodology, I would just say there is a real strong consensus within, I think, the, our entire infectious disease and, and extended you know, internal medicine community that we would stay away from recommending ivermectin for anybody with COVID. I think when Big Pharma says, don't use my product, then you know they mean business. That's serious stuff, losing any money, I think. Um, so I think that's super helpful and just kind of reiterating the fact that we really haven't found any evidence that this is helpful and we have seen people get really really sick um, so kind of staying away from things like that is helpful and I think this actually helps move us on to our next kind of category of approval data FDA what are all these things that people throw out at us and how can we really sort through that um, and I think you know Pfizer has been in big conversations about this because it was recently FDA approved which we can talk a little bit more about um, but because of that approval, you know, where do we think, and I think this is the question that some people have, um, the data that has been released by Pfizer, I think some people haven't seen things since early 2021. So they wonder, did FDA approve it just based on data from back then at the end of 2020? Or really, when did they kind of decide this along the process? And is there more data available to the public? Yeah, so very, very good question. There, there's a lot of data that's available. And actually, as people probably know, um, the FDA is reviewing you know, Pfizer applications today for booster shots. So you know, earlier this month, Pfizer publicly posted all of their data about current vaccines, booster doses, adverse effects, prior to the FDA discussion that's happening today. So you know, if you're really interested in, you know, getting into the weeds, you're welcome to just go to the FDA website and look at all of their um, filings. So that, that information is very transparent. Um, in addition, you know, this safety information and efficacy is continually reviewed by the CDC event monitoring and other agencies around the world. And you can see, you know, I showed you some of our local data here where we're looking at, you know, how, how vaccines are really having a significant impact on rates of death and hospitalization in a, you know, in a good way. Um, so there's a lot that's out there. Um, and if people have you know, specific questions on where to find it or, or what the data shows, I'm happy to, to talk about it. Um, Abby, on a related end, please feel free to chime in if there's anything else you want to add to that. Um, but I was going to ask you, you know, th th I think there's a lot of confusion also around the term EUA, emergency use authorization, and whether, that's, whether the EUA has ended now that Pfizer is fully approved um, because people are still using that term EUA? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I think it's very, there's a lot of reasons for that, for that to cause confusion. So yes, Pfizer was FDA approved, but it was FDA approved for specific things. So it was approved for people over the age of 16, um, 
and that is you know covered in that broad approval. The EUA, which is the emergency use authorization, now that was originally in the beginning for all these vaccines when we were uh, making sure they were safe and they were still passing a lot of benchmarks but weren't fully FDA approved yet. And we do a lot of things, just to clarify for some people to kind of give an idea, that are off-label things for the FDA. So the FDA may approve a medicine for one specific thing, but then there are other evidence and data that shows that we can use it maybe for this other side project. So there's a little bit of always difference there. But I would say in regards to this exactly, the EUA is still there for Pfizer because we are still using it for people aged 12 to 15. And we're still using it as a third dose for immunocompromised people over the age of 12. Now, those two aspects of Pfizer have not been FDA approved yet. And like Dr. Cohen was saying, that is currently being looked at. The FDA has a lot on their plate. They're trying to, uh, you know, they're trying to approve Moderna. They're trying to get um, booster approvals they are trying to approve the vaccine for kids under the age of 12. So I think there's a lot going on there and we'll see that slowly process through time. But yes, to summarize, FDA approved for people over the age of 16, still emergency use authorization for those under the age of 16 between 12 to 15 and as a third dose for those who are immunocompromised. And I think that actually brings me to another question that we saw in the Q&A is that, you know, for kids under 12, um, what is the process right now looking like? I know, Dr. Cohen, you have kids, and so maybe you've been following this a little bit more closely than me, but have you heard anything um, about the approval for kids younger than 12 and younger than five, I think, was the question that was asked as well. Yeah, so, I, you know, I have young kids, and they're actually, it's, it's so funny, they, they hate getting the flu vaccine every year, they do it, um, but they are really excited to get the COVID vaccine, and it's, it's amazing to hear kids on the playground talking about the vaccine to each other. Um, so yes, we expect that uh, Pfizer will file for approval um, for use uh, in kids under the age of 12. We think that'll probably happen uh, at the beginning of October, and then it'll take the FDA some time to review it. Those dates can change. Don't you know that that's the latest I've heard as of today? But you know, I'll, everything with COVID is subject to change. I think you know it's a great question in the Q and A about what about kids under five. Yes, those studies are ongoing. Um, I don't know when those results are going to be released. My guess is it will probably happen in 2022 at some point. Um, I would be thrilled if it happened earlier, um, but it, it's right now unknown. Thank you. Yeah, that insight is, I don't always follow the children as much because I don't have any of my own. So I know who to go to when I'm worried about concerns for kids. Um, I think we can shift a little bit, just maybe briefly, I know we're kind of running out of time here, um, but I know there was a decent amount of questions about the fact that we have now this Washington state mandate for healthcare workers and government workers to get vaccinated. Um, and I think people just wanna know a little bit more information about that, as in why our state decided to move forward with that, where not all states have moved forward with that. And Dr. Cohen, I know you're in some of these higher level conversations. Do you have any insight on that for us? You know, I, I'm happy to share a few thoughts and, and you know, interested to hear your thoughts as well. But I, I would say there's no question that Washington State is leading the way on this. You know, many states are following suit as are businesses in the private sector. You know, all healthcare entities that accept money from Medicare and Medicaid are mandated. You know, everybody at the VA hospitals, you know, are um, have a vaccine mandate. Everybody in the military needs to get vaccinated, and everybody who works in the U.S. government. So, I think the challenge is right now we're seeing these disparities in regulations from state to state. And while Washington is doing a great job keeping up their vaccination rates, other states may not be, um, you know, uh, as close behind us um, with their vaccination rates. And so we will continue to be impacted um, even by, our, our hospitals will continue to be impacted by other states' policies, I think until everybody um, reaches more of a standard approach to mandating vaccination. But I, I, I will say just on a personal level, nobody likes being told what to do. I don't like being told what to do. My kids don't like being told what to do. Um, but this is clearly something that has a public health benefit. And I think as a community, we are seeing, you know, our hospitals get overtaken by people with COVID. We are seeing people, you know, kids in the hospitals, you know, children's is having a spike in pediatric hospitalizations. And this is just something that we can't continue to live with. Um, and so for that reason, I understand why people are hesitant, um, but I think that's why we need a mandate. I think that's such an important thing to acknowledge. None of us like being told what to do, not our pets, not our kids, not our friends. But I think when we have to sit back and kind of look at the bigger picture and the effect that it has on those around us, that's really how these things end up feeling like the right way to go. 
Um, and I know there are, again, we probably don't have time to run all through these things, but there's questions about exemptions. I just want to clarify that with the state mandate, philosophical exemptions are no longer something that's being considered. Really, it's medical or religious. Um, the medical ones are, you know, very limited to kind of basically allergic reactions from the vaccine. There's more details on what qualifies on the CDC websites, and you're, you're welcome to ask your primary care doctors about that. And the religious exemptions are a little bit harder to define, but the definition, at least from the Washington state, is that any deeply held religious beliefs that conflicts with the requirement, there is paperwork to fill out um, and things to answer. So if you have questions with your employers, whether that be the hospital or other sectors, um, they have forms for you and you can kind of go through that process. I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that, Dr. Cohen. No, not at all. Um, I'll just say, you know, we're kind of coming down to, uh, we're almost at time. So if anybody has any last minute questions, we're more than happy to tackle them. Um, Abby, I, I know this is something um, you know, near to your heart, and you spend a lot of time counseling people. Um, just in general, um, are there strategies that um, how, how you approach people who may be hesitant about vaccination? Yeah, I think it really depends on the person and the reasoning. I know for a lot of communities of color, some of this stems from the fact that obviously the healthcare ent entity has been completely untrustworthy in the past, right? I mean, there's no really way around that. There have been issues with transparency and clarity and giving out the information. So I think, you know, on one side, there's those concerns and I would say those are valid concerns, but I think in our current situation, what ends up happening a lot of the time too is that those are the same people who get kind of left behind and overlooked and remain unprotected when concerned about things as far as new treatments and new vaccines. And I 100% agree that people should make sure that they're looking things up and take onus for that and try to find the information and use the resources. But I think it's important to remember that when things disproportionately affect others, like we saw early on with COVID, um, that it's important that we try to stay on top of these things that will prevent us from being on that other side. Um, and now that we've seen the vaccine out for so long and we've seen so many people, other people get it, I think that's very helpful and that we can kind of learn that, okay, maybe in this small situation, we can let go of some of that mistrust as we work together as an entity to kind of outreach and make sure that we're making things as equitable as possible. And I think as a healthcare system, we have such a long way to go to really gain the trust that we have lost back. And I think we have to continue to work towards that and understand where people are coming from. But at the same time, we want to make sure that these same people don't get continuously left behind. So I think that's from that side. And then from the other side of concerns and safety, again, I encourage people to ask those who are around them, attend these talks, to post your questions, use the resources on the Department of Health, the CDC websites to really get those questions answered. Because I think the theme of this is in order for us to move forward and to go and to progress and to get out of this, vaccination really is going to be the key there. I'm sorry, that was probably a lot in one, but I just wanted to get it in while I could. No, I think that's a, that's a great note to end on. Um, thank you all so much for joining us. I could not agree more. We appreciate you thinking about these issues. We appreciate you talking about them with your friends, with people in the community. Um, and we are always happy to talk to people if you have specific concerns. But I think both Dr. Hussein and I feel very, very strongly that vaccination is safe and it's going to be our only way out of you know, this pandemic and getting back to some semblance of normalcy. So thank you all for hanging in there over the last 18 months. Um, and uh, we look forward to seeing you at another session. Thank you.